You're listening to the Journey to Launch podcast, creating financial wellness for yourself and innovative entrepreneurship with Marsha Barnes of the Finance Bar. T-minus 10 seconds. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. I am excited to talk to you today as I am every single week. So buckle up, get into the rocket chair. I actually saw I'm a really cool meme or repost, and I thought it really went with my brand. So I'm going to share it with you. It said, If someone tells you that you can get on the rocket, don't ask where you're going to sit. Just get in the damn rocket. And that's what I'm telling you guys to do. Get in the rocket with me. What's the worst that can happen? You learn something. I mean, the podcast is this is why I love podcasts and why I fell in love with podcasting. It's super uh, low risk. I mean, it's free for you to listen to all this amazing information. Right. And it's really only if you want to take the extra steps, if you hear someone or hear maybe something I mentioned, a product that I have, the membership I have. Or anything else that you can say, all right, maybe I'll invest, I'll do something different. But what I love about podcasting is the fact that you can get so much valuable information for free. And with my podcast, I like to basically offer you a variety of topics, people, and just resources where you get to choose. I invite you to my rocket, but like literally we're kind of in tandem in rockets together going off into our own journeys of financial freedom and independence. And with that, you get to fuel your rocket with what works for you. So with all that being said, I'm bringing you another conversation in which I hope that you can make it fuel your journey to financial freedom and independence. This week on the podcast, I have Marsha Barnes, who is the founder of The Finance Bar, the first personal finance hub on wheels and personal finance suite. You're going to hear all about this amazing bus that she created to help with people's finances. She's based out of Charlotte, North Carolina. She's been in the business for a bit of time. I remember when I first started Journey to Launch, she was one of what I considered like the vets in the game. And so it's pretty dope that I get to interview her on the podcast. And I actually met Marsha um, in person and she's just as amazing as she is online. If you see her her brand and just like how she is online with her folks and her community. So I'm really excited for you to hear Marsha's story. Okay, before we do hop into the episode, I just got to let you know about this free training that I'm putting on with former guest Terry Idioma. So Terry was on episode 154 of the podcast, and the title of her podcast was How She Quit Her Job to Begin Trading Full-Time and Traveling the World. So if you did not listen to that episode, go listen to that episode. Walk, don't run your fingers to find that episode. And Terry talked about how she was able to quit her job and travel the world. And not only has she now created a business out of trading, she's helping other people trade Also, I got such good responses and people interested in what Terry was doing and her class that she offers. I mean, a lot. Even my little sister (laughs) was DMing me and texting me like, "Um, I'm I'm joining her course. And I was like, okay. So I wanted to be able to team up with Terry to bring more information to what she does. And that's what we're doing. So on June 3rd at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, Terry and I are teaming up to bring you a class, how to make money in the stock market and to avoid the uncertainty of the economy. And I'm really excited about it. So if you want to join us for free, this is a free class, go to journeytolaunch.com slash trading class. Once again, journeytolaunch.com slash trading class to join us on June 3rd at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. If you want the episode show notes for this episode, go to journeytolaunch.com or you can click the description of wherever you're listening to this episode to get the full episode show notes. Now, if you are a new listener to the podcast or an OG journeyer, I've created a jumpstart guide to help you on your journey to financial freedom. It includes the top episodes to listen to, the stages to go through to reach financial freedom, resources to help you, and so much more. Get it for free by texting LAUNCH to 33777. Text LAUNCH to 33777 or go to journeytolaunch.com slash jumpstart to get your guide for free right now. Okay, let's hop into the episode. 
Hey, journeyers. I'm really, really excited to have on today's guest on the podcast. I have Marsha Barnes from the Finance Bar. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Jamila. How are you? Good, good. And I'm excited to talk to you because I remember I'm um, seeing your brand, seeing you when I first started Journey to Launch as someone who's been in the space, making an impact um, in, a, in a very unique way. So for those of you like who don't know Marsha, like Marsha and her like finance bar, like her brand, like she actually has a bus that educates people with finances. And I love, we can talk about like you and how you started that, but I really want to like dive into like your journey into personal finance. What um, made you so passionate and committed to helping people get it together? And then your entrepreneurship journey. So I'd love to hear more. Well, I would first say, Jamila, the first, one of the first things that made me so passionate about the topic of finance in general was because my, the, Majority of my career has been in finance, aside from when I was in the Navy, straight out of high school. So I went to high after high school, I went straight to the Navy. And then after that, I went to college. So when I started working in finance, I would always hear from customers that were going through like foreclosure or bankruptcy proceedings. And I would listen to their stories of how did they get to where they were. And many of those stories stem from either mismanagement of money or loss of jobs, the death of a spouse. So a lot of it, Jamila, kind of came from just not being prepared. But it wasn't just the customers that I talked to. I would also be on lunch break or just my breaks at work. And I would hear women on their breaks trying to call companies to figure out payment plans for their light bills and for their cable bills. But around that same time, both of my parents were being laid off from their jobs. And what I learned from my parents is when they were laid off from their jobs, while it was an inconvenience for them financially, it was not an emergency because they were prepared. And something similar happened with my best friend. She also worked at a bank, not with me, but she was also laid off. She was also prepared. So part of that uh, for me really came from seeing how unfortunate it was for people to work so hard, to go to work every single day. and not financially have anything to show for it, not actually in things, but when they had, when they fell on hardships, it became a challenge for them to kind of find their footing. And that kind of frightened me personally. It it frightened me. So I was like, you know, I'm in finance. What can I do around town? I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm just going to start having events to talk about this thing. And people would start to come out, Jamila. And I was like, you know what? They don't talk about finance in school. At the time, my son was preparing to graduate from high school at that time. And I said, you know what would be neat? If there were some type of mobile bus that could travel around to different schools to educate students at public schools, but also colleges about finances. Fashion trucks were very popular here. Food trucks were very popular here. And I was like, if they can do that on a truck, I can put finance on a bus. I didn't have a plan like around how this would be done. I didn't know where to go get a bus. I just researched it. And really that's how it started. Which I think is like fascinating because, you know, it's like a a great idea, like comes to you. You're seeing all these like success in other areas with buses. You seeing a need in the community for personal finance information. And then you do something about it because some people like you'll have those thoughts and you're like, oh, but I don't even know where to start. And they don't do it because it just seems like a lot of work or intimidating. So what made you feel like, okay, I'm actually going to like, pursue this? Did you know then that it could possibly be what you did full-time as an entrepreneur? No. You didn't even think that far? No, not at all. When, when I purchased the school bus, Jamila, there was no thought around I would be leaving my job to do this full-time. Not at all. Once I got the bus, it was really, I'm going to do this. I'm going to test it out. No sort of business model. So I figured, you know, after research, I could make it a nonprofit and still work for the bank. I can kind of do this on the weekends or like take PTO sometimes from work and like go to high schools on Fridays and colleges. In my mind, that's the limit. That's how limited I was in my thoughts around getting the bus. But never did I think it would be a full-time business at all. That was not even on the table. Mm. So at what point, so you so you get the bus, yep. um, but you have to invest in that too. So even though you didn't think it was going to be like a business, it still took upfront money, right? Like you had to buy the bus, you had to like outfit the bus because literally, and I want to post pictures in the show notes for people in case they just don't know what this bus looks like. 
And you still to this day have the bus? I still to this day have the bus. The bus to this day, ever since I bought it, once I first bought it, I just got it up, made sure the logo and my branding was on it. But recently, what last year, actually, the bus was rebranded. So it has an entirely different look now. But I still have the bus. Now, can you just describe visually what it looks like? Because people are like, okay, what kind of bus is this? Is this like, um, you know, like a truck? Like, but this is like yeah. an actual bus people can walk into and sit it's, down. Yeah, it's an actual bus. So if every anyone listening, if you imagine a school bus. So a school bus typically may seat maybe 20, 22 students. My bus is half of that. So when I first got the bus, what the gentleman shared with me that sold it to me is that the bus could actually fit like 15 people. So I was like, great. That's like a great size because I would never have at least 15 students on a bus trying to teach them anything. So the outside of the bus, of course, uh, people will be able to see that when you share it online. But the inside of the bus, it is it has like bars where you could imagine yourself at a bar sitting up in stools. They're pushed up to the bar where I could I envision people being able to work either with me or work. What by themselves on their computer. So whether it was a student, you know, a young student or an adult. And I have, there's like two bars on each side. So it has the capacity to sit four people in that section alone. Then there's a section where people like a little lower level that could on each side could fit three people. And then towards the back is my actual desk. And across from my desk, there's a couch where people could also sit on as well. Now, I've never like had the bus full to capacity because usually when I'm out doing things on the bus, it's usually a couple of students on the bus at one time or a few adults. So we can have like group conversations and group dialogues. But if it's adults and I'm at a corporation where there's employees, there's always only one person with me for privacy reasons. But if you imagine it looks just like a little office, it's just on wheels where you can sit and learn and there's heat, there's air. But that's basically how it looks on the inside and very colorful. It, it yeah. Matches my brand. Yeah. It's very so colorful. innovative. So you started it to really not thinking it can be something that could make you money and be your full time job. So how did that start to go when you started to transition to making it a business? When did you realize, hey, I think I can actually do this full time and impact more people? So when I got the bus, Jamila, it gained a lot of attention from the media. And I found myself like having to take PTO to do interviews for people to come see the bus, to videotape me on the bus. But not only that, once I began doing it, it gained media attention, but also from a lot of corporations that started to ask me to speak. And I'll never forget, I was at the Essence Festival and I was speaking on behalf of State Farm. And I shared with my husband when we were leaving, I had got off the stage and I said, you know what, when I'm when I get back home. I'm going to keep working, but it won't be for long. So I get back home and then it was world news. World news reached out to me and said, hey, we want to send a team out to Charlotte to interview you about the bus. And they did. While I was at my interview, Jamila, my boss called me and said that they had gotten word that I was interviewing with um, NBC and make sure you don't say anything about the bank and all, you know, all of these things. And I dare wouldn't like, that was never my goal. I'm featuring me, not the company that I'm working for. And it was at that moment that I realized that while this was a blessing and all these great things were happening for me, it was beginning to be a little bit too much between me and my job. And I had the members club then I had the members club, but it was nowhere where it is. It was nowhere at that time where it is now because I didn't put much focus around it because I had a job. So Mm -hmm. it was at that moment that I said to me, I have to figure out a way to make sure that I get recurring income every month beyond the bus to make this a full-time thing, because I knew at that point I would have to leave my job. It became too much, way too fast. Yeah. 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 So one of the things I didn't ask you about, if you don't mind sharing, like just also like the startup cost, because like a physical like bus and like to buy it and to like redo it, because you were still working. So essentially yeah. your job became like your investor. Like any, your, I'm assuming the checks you got from your job. That's, that's right. You able to, yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So I would say, Jamila, if I think about getting the bus wrapped and start up the cost of getting any repairs to the bus, it was probably around 20000 And it may have been a little bit more, but it was definitely around that much. But I don't think it spanned beyond $30,000. At least not initially, it didn't. So just to get the bus up, get it going, not counting any website design, getting the word out of, out there, none of that. But 
around 20,000. Yeah. And the thing about the bus is that it's functional. Like you drive, you can drive it. Yeah. Right? So that yeah. was the other thing. Yep. It's an actual drivable bus, which means that, you know, whether someone's on the bus or not, I still have to pay taxes each year. I still have to pay insurance every single month, but it's an actual drivable bus. Now the bus doesn't go as fast as a car because, you know, many people ask me all the time, like, can you bring it here? Can you bring it there? I'm like, guys, it's not like a, it doesn't go at the speed of a car. Imagine a school bus with kids on it. You know, many state laws is that a bus cannot go beyond like 55 miles per hour because they were created to carry students. So my bus is very much the same, but it's definitely a drivable bus. It doesn't just sit. Yeah. So how long ago was it that then you quit your job? So you kind of got the concept, it seems, 2016? 2016. That's when I went full time at the end of 2016. So when did you first get the bus and start the company? I got the bus the earlier part of 2015 because I remember how hot it used to be in the summer when I used to do work on the bus or just cleaning up the inside of the bus in 2015. So from the time I got the bus to the time I actually quit my job was within a one year span. So how did you prepare to quit your job? Because, you know, you have a family, I'm assuming Mm -hmm. you've got bills, you got possibly a mortgage. What was that transition like to prepare yourself for full-time entrepreneurship? You're right. I have all of those things. At the time, our son was about to head to college. We have a mortgage. So what I did, Jamila, was I figured out ways Once I traveled around for whether it was speaking engagements or meeting women that had visited the bus by way of colleges or if their corporation hired me to bring the bus there, what ways would I be able to stay in contact with them beyond the bus? Beyond the bus and beyond me actually like working with them one-on-one. And then that's when I really started thinking about how can I enhance my members club? So the members club is my online community where, where members are educated every single month on a different topic. And every single month, we have a different expert in the members club because what I realized is for a lot of people, if they're reading a blog, if they're reading a podcast, if they're reading books, they're doing a lot of things, Jamila, but that wasn't the problem. Lack of information is not the problem. The challenge is lack of information and you getting it consistently. And on several different topics. So on top of that, you have these goals that you want to accomplish every single year. So in my mind, I said, how can I do this for women to stay consistent and for them to reach their goals, but also to be fed information every single month at the rate that they get things like their hair done or you know, Netflix? How can I do that? And that's when I really started wrapping up the members club. Right. See what their needs was like at a very low cost, because what I was hearing is I don't have money. I don't know where my money goes. So how can I start that? And my goal, Jamila, I'll be honest, when I left my job, it wasn't about, oh, let me make six figures each month or like these big, large goals for myself. It was if I'm able to make at least what I made from my employer, a company that I had been with almost 13 years, if I can make that in one members club. In one members club, one service, then I'm fine with that. And that's what I work towards. Mm. Once you figure it out, like a consistent, it sounds like potential revenue stream, you felt confident that you could potentially like leave. So because I'm asking this because there's some people listening right now and they have, whether it's personal finance or not, like just any business, right? And they're doing on the side or they're thinking about what can they do eventually to leave their job? What are some of the things they should consider? Because, you know, I also recently made a transition to full-time entrepreneurship. And it's so funny because, you know, we're in the same space, personal finance, you have a members club, I have an online um, uh, monthly community and annual community too. And so what I do love about this space in particular, like the personal finance space is that we all have different audiences, some overlap, but you know, it's like, it doesn't feel like competition, quote unquote, right? Like it's like, it's so supportive. And because also with the abundance mindset that I think is what is we should be teaching our audiences is that there's enough to go around, right? Like, so just because you're successful here doesn't mean you can't be successful in the same thing because we do things differently. I just feel like some people are like probably wondering or thinking, all right, I have this idea, kind of scared maybe to take this risk or I want to prepare to take it. So for you, it sounds like you thought of the business, possible income streams, but then what did you like do to prepare for the leap? Did you save up some months expenses? Was your husband part of your like plan? Like did, you know, factor in if he was working or not? You know, I'm sure that that has something to do with too, right? That conversation with him. Right. So he was part of the plan, but not part of the plan for me to actually quit Jamila. And what I mean by that is that my husband, 
works a nine to five job. So he's been at for a, a quite some time now. So for me, I knew that maybe like I could go on his insurance. So that was like number one, like health insurance, because there's such a cost associated with being an entrepreneur and insurance. But my initial way of preparation, yes, I put back six months of monthly expenses. That was first. I did that first. But the goal to sustain my income was to be able to get a runway of expenses that I needed to pay each month, meaning that the goal was not to make more than I needed to make initially. The goal was to create a runway, enough money consistently every single month to pay the things that I needed to pay and to save money every month. And that is what I calculated. So for anyone listening, a runway is essentially you earn enough money consistently each month to pay your bills, your personal bills, whatever business bills you have, business expenses, and then also save because I think that's necessary when you are attempting to become an entrepreneur. You never want to just table savings because it's even more important. It's important for everyone, but it's also super important, more important for an entrepreneur. I'm not sure if you agree with that or not, Jamila, but- Oh my gosh. There's, yeah. there's a huge difference because as one thing I want people to understand is that as an employee of a company or an organization, you can have a bad day at work and you'll still get paid. When you're an entrepreneur, you are responsible for everything. So we don't really have the luxury of just kind of like falling off here and there you everything that you have to do or accomplish, you, you're trying to build it at a level of excellence. And that's what I worked on. But never because a lot of what we hear now, and I'm sure that your audience may hear it. A lot of what we hear now that's promoted is let me make sure I make this amount of money each month. And that can be very discouraging for someone that's just trying to start out. You feel like you're not doing enough. And that's why I always say that our journeys are very personal, because for me, it was if I can earn enough money, at least what I made at my job, then I'm, I'm a success story. Because it took me how many years to earn this at my job and I'm doing this in less than five years in business, that to me, that that is success and still being profitable. Make sure you have your runway first. That is the goal, that you have enough money where you're able to pay your personal bills, your business expenses, you're saving some money, and then you also have coverage for your health insurance and then like disability insurance, those types of things. And then work your way up from there. But initially have some money saved back three or six months. And I think it, many people can do that with the jobs they have, especially if you receive bonuses, focus on that. And then, you know, work your way backwards to get to where yeah. you want to be. You teach about finances too. So then being in the best position to also be debt-free, um, if you can, uh, before you take a leap like that, because the less that you have to send out, the less runway you need and or the less money your business needs to make to sustain yourself. Now, I think it's actually important. So I'm glad we're talking about like business and entrepreneurship. Because I think for even like for me, like I did my research, I kind of understood this, but I feel like you really don't get it until you're like living it fully and completely like entrepreneurship life full time. Yeah. Like the dollar, right? So if someone hears, and I, I did a post about this um, on Twitter and Instagram, it was very popular. Like everyone like was like responding to it because I said, you know, the business and I forgot the exact number, but like it made 80 something thousand last year, like mm-hmm. journey to launch. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean I made, <laughs> I did not make 80,000, right? Because you have taxes, yep. you got business expenses, yes, ma'am. You got all these things. And so it's important to like talk through that. Cause sometimes like if you have like a product or service and you know, your audience sees that you're selling it for this much, it's important to realize that the, the business owner is not getting that amount because that's covering not only their business expenses, but then their hopefully personal expenses for them to even run this business, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. That's very important because let's just do a very simple analogy. When I first, let's say the members club, because that was like the thing that started to make me profitable. It was $10 in the beginning. Okay. Well, after using the system I had to use, I really got $9 and 41 cents after that. Well, after making sure that all of the creations and all of the things were designed and all of those things, I was down to probably like under $8 of being able to take from that. But on top of that, there's taxes, as you mentioned, that has to be paid off of every single dollar I make each month. So let's just say 20% off of everything you make each month 
should be going over to taxes or a bucket for your taxes. So you have to look at things, not as if I'm earning all of this money and I have this revenue. Revenue is not profit. So for anyone listening that may not be an entrepreneur yet, let's say you work your job and you earn $90,000 each year. Well, if you earn $90,000 each year, and let's say after taxes come out, you may be at 75 or 70 and your household expenses for the entire year, you paid out $60,000 in expenses for your household. Well, at the end of the day, if you could turn around for a business owner, that means I made $10,000. I profited it. That's right. a simple analogy because you spent out your expenses kind of like took all of your money. It's the same way as an entrepreneur. So it goes back to your point of the less overhead you have, which is something I'm very adamant about, Jamila. The less overhead you have, a lot of people don't mind living off credit as business owners. I'm one that I prefer not to. The more debt you have, the more expenses you have, the more money you have to pay out. But I'll also add something that's very important to the world of entrepreneurs, I personally feel. For me, I did not want to be like this hamster on a wheel, always working. My husband is very dear to me. My son is very dear to me. And I didn't want to create something that would take me away from them often. And so that's something else I want business owners to consider or soon to be business owners to consider. If you are listening is make sure that the business that you are designing or attempting to create matches the lifestyle that you want to live. Because you don't, I think that there's a way that you can resent also being an entrepreneur, which is a conversation we also don't talk about enough. Yeah. And and to go back to your point, making money as an entrepreneur, like that dollar pays for your business expenses and your personal expenses. Like That is correct. But I think it's important to note too, because so so many people, right? You listen to this podcast more than likely you're interested in reaching financial freedom and independence. And part of that can involve entrepreneurship. I don't think that entrepreneurship is for everyone. I always say like, if you have a job that you love or a skill set that someone else can pay you for, go with that. And if you can become a 401k millionaire or invest in real estate on the side or do something on the side, do that, right? But for um, some people, like they're trying to escape maybe something that they don't love, like a job they don't love, not realizing that, like you said, you can create almost like another prison for yourself with your own business. Yeah. Not intentionally designing it in a way that works for you because you actually end up, from my experience, to build up a business working a lot more and you care so much more. So much more is on the line than going into a job and just clocking out and be like, all right, I'm done. So I just think it's really important to one, realize, and maybe this is a question for you, like how does someone know if entrepreneurship is for them mentally and emotionally, right? Because there's a different, it's a different level of playing field. I look at entrepreneurship somewhat, Jamila, like I look at investing. It's, It's about your risk tolerance. If you're someone that you enjoy having a consistent income every single month and you are someone that you enjoy routine a lot and you are someone that you would prefer a company to come up with ideas and then you can just kind of be a part of the team to create these ideas or to just get the job done, then I don't think that you're, that entrepreneurship is for you. I definitely believe that everyone may have a talent that they could earn money from somehow. And sometimes that just me- may mean you're a good person with customer service and you can just go work at a mall maybe and just work at a, a retail store and be good at that. It doesn't mean you have to create something yourself and then sell it. But I do also believe that when it comes to entrepreneurship, you have to say to yourself, I know for me, it was like, I know I'm in my mind, I see so much in the world of personal finance that needs to take place and it's not happening. So what can I create? And oddly enough, I didn't have any fear behind getting the bus. I didn't even have fear when I quit my job because I knew that it was a need. And I knew that women would gravitate towards it if it was said to them in a certain way where they understood and they didn't feel judged for the judged by the decisions that they had made. So I think all of those things, you have to ask yourself, am I equipped for the world of full-time entrepreneurship? Am I creative? Do I have enough stamina to, to continue to create? What type of life am I trying to create for myself? I would dream, Jamila, about having time. And this, this sounds really corny, but it, it's really my truth. I would be at work sometimes and I would say to myself, 
one day, I just wish like in the middle of the day, around 11 o'clock each day, I just had the flexibility to walk through Target, not even to buy anything, but just to walk through Target. I would dream about my son going off to college and me being able to grab my laptop and traveling to see him and not have to worry about punching in or to go see my husband at work and to sit with, at lunch with him without me then having to rush back to work. That was 100% my motivation. So all of those things, I think it goes back to what is the, not being an entrepreneur is the goal, but what life are you attempting to design for yourself? And, and that's how I just made things happen for me. Mm. Everything that you mentioned, like while it does take money to be able to sustain that, it's like the simple freedoms. Like that's why like money is yeah. important. It's a tool, but really what we're looking for is freedom and flexibility with our lives. Cause I am smiling as you were talking because part of it too, is even if like, maybe you're not exactly where you want to be, even if you uh-huh. don't really care about being an entrepreneur, I want, I'm challenging everyone right now to find where they do have flexibility. So not everything has to be like, oh, I work in this job and I hate it and there's nothing good about it. Right. So like, I think about when I was working, like we had moved into it, like a new office um, at my job and like they had a really ni- nice outdoor space that we can go out and take breaks and appreciating like those little things. And then I'm thinking about now my current situation, being able to take my kids to school every day, yeah. pick them up, you know, someone calls is sick. Oh, got to go pick them up. Oh, you know, they need something, change of clothes. Like I can do all of those things. And that's wealth. Like the fact that I can do that right now, that is what I was looking for all along. So mm-hmm. I think it's important to realize where you have that in your life now so you can appreciate it. Because I think the more you appreciate, the more it appreciates. And then looking forward to this life, what is it that you're looking for that's going to bring you joy and happiness? Yeah. And then also to your point, Jamila, that was part of my vision for the women and couples that I wanted to work for. Do I earn money? Yes. But for me, it was less about money. And once I was able to create this life for myself, I felt like it was it was only right for me to then teach other women and educate them on how to do that for themselves. Not that they wanted to be entrepreneurs and create their job, just to have more freedom in their life. Money in many ways grants you freedom. And you, I think that that, however you want to take that for whoever's listening, it in some ways grants you freedom. It says that, Maybe you don't, you can earn money, but you don't have to earn this amount of money all the time, or you can take more time off or to your, your point, I can get my kids from school. To me, that is freedom. That is what real wealth is. Money solves a lot of issues, but I don't think money does very little for the heart. And as human beings, we work from the heart. We don't work for money. If I just look at money, you know, I don't want to get too deep here, but if I just look at money and I say to myself, I'm really financially wealthy but I no longer have my husband and my son. Am I really going to love that money so much? Absolutely not. So that's right. why I always decided to reverse engineer how I created the finance bar and what I chose to be, how I chose to build my model because I understood what I valued most. And that was my family over money. Right, right. And even with like the job, right? Like staying for me in a job, I could have stayed there guaranteed money, guaranteed yes. inc- income and bonuses. But at the end of the day, that wasn't what was fulfilling to me. So you talk to tons of women, you help women um, and couples. I think everyone's searching for this level of freedom in their lives. And yes, money is a part of that. So what would you say are the most common things you come across, like blocks that people are experiencing, keeping them from realizing this freedom? Would you say it's like mindset, income, expenses? Like what, what do you feel like you come across a lot? I think it's all three of them that you just mentioned, Jamila. But if I had to pinpoint one, it would definitely be mindset because mindset oftentimes says, if I'm not happy at this job, then what I am going to do is the money I earn from this job. I'm just going to go buy everything that I want from the money that I've earned from this job that I don't like so much. And what happens when we do that is now we go, we spend, well, a lot of times we spend every dime we have to, and then the rest goes towards bills. We don't save, we get into debt. So then it becomes a cycle because our mindset says, I'm not at a place I don't enjoy. So my enjoyment will come from getting the things that I really want out of life. I think that's the, that's the biggest block opposed to taking time to really sit to, unbe- to gain a better understanding around. You said it earlier, those small freedoms that our jobs give us and then taking that and realizing or thinking about more deeply, what is the life that you want to design for yourself? And then you, you use money 
to begin creating that life. And again, that doesn't mean quitting your job. That just means what freedom are you trying to get more of? Is it you want to have time to cook when you get off work and you don't want to spend your money all the time eating out? Do you need more time? Is Are you just mismanaging time so you don't cook or you don't have time to work out? All these things that we feel like we deserve, a good quiet meal at home, time in the mornings or afternoon or evening to exercise or to move my body, more time with our kids. All of those go, go back to things that we value. So I would share that 90% of the time, it's mindset over money. I know people that earn really great income, but when it comes to the way they bucket that money out and where it goes, it's not spent on things that bring them long lasting joy. And that's not my opinion. These are things that I've been told. So we're just kind of, I think, spending money a lot, Jamila, just to escape our reality of what our heart really feels and deals with every single day. Yeah. And it's interesting because this is like this life energy or money concept. Vicki Robbins, um, the book, Your Money or Your Life, she was on that podcast. I'll try to link that episode. And in her book, she talks about like, if you think about the cost per hour of like how much you're earning, like what that breaks down to per hour, like your life energy, Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a calculation. And then when you spend money, is that meal worth four hours of your life's energy or whatever, right? Like, like I forget the exact calculation, but it's very um, poignant to like understand, like, it's not bad to spend. Like I actually, I enjoy spending money on the things that I value, right? But it's like when you understand the opportunity cost and or what it really took for you to earn that money in the first place, mm-hmm. then you may start making different decisions on, is it really worth it to you? You might think differently about how you then spend and earn your money if it's worth That's it. That's right. Yeah, for sure. It goes back to what I said earlier about having enough time, though. If when we're, when we're time poor and all of our time is devoted to moving or thinking or doing, we have very little time to think about what we truly value and how much those things cost us. So a lot of people eat out because of convenience. You go to a restaurant, it's quick. You don't have to worry about cooking or cleaning up. The restaurant is the fix for you. It solves a problem. It solves the problem of me not having to buy groceries. And some people still do that and still go out to eat. But I don't have to think about cooking. I don't have to think about cleaning up. A lot of times we're just not slowing down enough to think about the things that we value And if those things cost us at all or how much money we're really spending out each month, that's not bringing us lifelong joy. And I'm not saying everything you spend, you know, I'm not trying to be all frou-frou and say every dollar you spend has to bring you deep joy. That's not what I'm saying. But I do think it's extremely important to identify what you value in life. And then that's the way you decide how you spend your money. Not just on convenience, not what's just quick for you. And I think that is the way that you begin to enjoy a life that you really love, even if it's beyond entrepreneurship. Yeah. Thinking about how someone can begin to like live a life they enjoy. I always like talk about being able to reach financial freedom without necessarily all the money in the bank just yet. And a lot of that is an internal journey. So how have you like personally, like your own journey? Now you've been doing this for going on four years full time impacting lives the way you have what for you like have you been able to reach your personal finance goals it's always funny you know how like I felt like I was way more like into my own personal finances like I mean like doing it every day looking at stuff before I took journey to launch as serious as as I am now I mean obviously I still budget I still look at like my financial freedom goals and numbers but I always find that sometimes like when you fully immerse yourself in it are you as on top of and into your own personal goals? like Oh yeah, for sure. Yes, right. So what does that look like for you? Yeah, so for sure. As much as I, I feel like as much as I try to speak to my audience, like let's just say social media. And I look at social media as like my ministry to people that I may never meet in life. A lot of what I share are some of my own experiences. Every single week, there's a day that I'm always working on my finances. Every single day, I may take at least 30 minutes just to look over some documents or something related to finances. It may not even be like banking information. It may just be insurance information or jumping on with our financial planner to think about ways that we prepare ourselves for when we get older and what, what does our son need to have on us, like a will, a power of attorney. So I am very immersed in that process every week and sometimes, Jamila, every single day. Every single month, I'm always fully aware 
if I earned enough money in business? Am I still on target? Am I earning? Am I spending too much? Did we save enough? Did we save what we said we were going to save? I'm very much on top of that. And I think, but again, I think that goes back to what I just said. It's important to me because my family is important to me. If it was just about the dollar, I don't think that it would be. But every way that I think about my money, I think about me personally, but then I also think about my husband and son. So that's why it's a habit for me. And that's why I keep harping on that in our conversation, because I believe if you just look at money as just money, you won't be so excited to like do a budget or create whatever you want to call it, a spending yeah. plan, whatever, whatever you do or you call it to make you feel better, how you spend your money, it has to be dedicated to a larger goal in your life beyond just, oh, saving money. Well, saving money for me in the past assisted me with quitting my job. It helped me to buy a bus. It changed my entire life, my entire career. So that was the goal. It wasn't just the money. So I am very much immersed into my personal finances and then our household finances. In that way, it helps me to better connect with my audience and then individuals I work with as clients. Yeah, and I agree with that because I think it's great when you're just living your truth and being honest, because that's the thing too. Like I always say, I talk to tons of personal finance leaders and people in this space and they also just want like people who follow them or people who follow me, they just want to also know that like that, it's okay. Like it's real. No one's also perfect. There's going to be times where you make a mistake or you don't understand something. So I always have no problem like saying like, look, I I don't understand that concept. I'm going to like research or look into it or find out more and share it with my audience. Because I think realizing that people are human. So if you do see someone doing amazing things with their money, um, whether it's earning it, managing it, building wealth, that they're human too, and that you can do the same thing, mistakes and whatever, or setbacks, like you can also accomplish these things. Like while they seem like big and maybe out of your reach, I just feel like this is accessible for anyone willing to be open to making mistakes, being open to not understanding things. Like this is a journey that anyone can embark on. Yeah, and then open, Jamila, also to recovery. Because Mm -hmm. a lot of times we find people in a at places where it's like, I had to repair some things first. We don't talk enough about people that are just trying to survive each month, people that are just behind on basic bills. Well, to be able to create a sufficient spending plan, or like I said, a budget, you first have to be current. So a lot Mm -hmm. of times this journey for me is about meeting people where they are. That was the finance bar motto. and, And it still is your journey to financial wellness, committed to meeting you where you are on your finance journey. So while I am on my way to where I want to be and a lot of financial goals I have met, I always know my mindset is it's not about me or the people that I'm working for. It's about where they are. So it's kind of like me saying, oh, yeah, Jamila, you know, I I invest this amount of money each month. So now I take that story with my clients. I'm like, oh, yeah, by now you should be investing because I was able to accomplish that. And for me, that's not the goal. It's about meeting people where they are. So that they can then do better financially and, you know, do a bit of unlearning and repair some things. Right, right. Well, Marsha, this has been such an insightful conversation. I hope if you're listening, whether you want to be an entrepreneur full time or not, you gain like some nuggets about living a life where you're more mindful of your money and then having more freedom. So thank you so much. And please let everyone know where they can find out more about you. I'm definitely going to link the pictures and more of your stuff in the episode show notes, but where can people connect with you more? Yeah, sure. So on social media, all over social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, you can find me at The Finance Bar. And then if you want to follow me on my personal Twitter page, it's Marsha H. Barnes. So M-A-R-S-H-A-H-B-A-R-N-E-S. So just my full name with an H in the middle. Okay. And I will definitely tag all of that in the show notes. Thanks so much, Marsha, for coming on. Thank you for having me, Jamila. Okay. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation with Marsha. As you can see, we basically covered a lot. You know, we covered topics pertaining to entrepreneurship, being that we're in the same business We have different approaches, but I think at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the same thing for the most part, which I think is so dope with this personal finance space is that there's so many ways you can tell people how to budget and what to do with their money, right? There's just some like foundational things that are going to be true no matter what. 
But I think it's the messenger or who you're hearing it from that you resonate with. So when I'm able to bring on people in the space like me who give services, have memberships or communities and do things maybe or has a different voice, do things differently. Um, I think it's pretty cool because it allows you to kind of see what resonates with you. But I'm really glad Marsha came on the show. So happy to have been able to share her voice with my audience. Now, if you love something that Marsha and I said, and maybe if you're one of Marsha's people and you're listening to the, my podcast for the first time, tag us on social media. I'm at Journey to Launch on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And Marsha is the finance bar on Instagram. And so if you want to like tag us on Instagram, if you listen to this and something like stood out for you and you're just like, I love that conversation, tag us, both of us, let us see so we can see what you're talking about. Don't forget, if you want the episode show notes to get any of the links mentioned in this episode, go to journeytolaunch.com or click the description wherever you're listening to this to get the link to the show notes. And if you want that free jumpstart guide to help you on your financial freedom journey, Text LAUNCH to 33777, text LAUNCH to 33777 to get your free guide today or go to journeytolaunch.com slash jumpstart. Don't forget to sign up for Terry and I's free class on June 3rd at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. You can do that by going to journeytolaunch.com slash trading class to grab your free seat right now to learn all about trading and what Terry does. If you want to support me and the podcast and love the free content and information that you get here, here are four ways that you can support me and the show. One, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you listen, whether that's Apple Podcasts, that purple app on your phone, your Android device, YouTube, Spotify, wherever it is that you happen to listen, just subscribe so you are not missing an episode. And if you're happening to listen to this in Apple Podcasts, rate, review, and subscribe there. I appreciate and read every single review. Number two, follow me on my social media accounts. I'm at Journey to Launch on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I love, love, love interacting with journeyers there. Three, support and check out the sponsors of this show if you hear something that interests you. Sponsors are the main ways we keep the podcast lights on here. So show them some love for supporting your girl. Four, and last but not least, share this episode, this podcast with a friend or family member or coworker so that we can spread the message of Journey to Launch. All right, that's it. Until next week, keep on journeying, journeyers. <laughs> <laughs>